I don't know if my mic is on. It's not. I don't know if you are a fan of or pay attention to or see poetic irony in life. Uh, when the world just seems to do something that couldn't be planned, right? And, and speaks in a way that, well, seems as if there's a design behind the whole thing, behind the whole thing. You never want to take that kind of thing as an actual sign from God, that that's not where we should put our hope. But it is interesting to me how time and again, not only history, but, but especially the history of the church and the liturgy of the church, serves to tell you exactly what you need to hear. So if you are paying attention to the psalm and the Old Testament reading and the epistle and the gospel today, you might think, given the announcement I made earlier, that I picked all that, you know, Friday afternoon. But nope. Nope, that's just what the church has been having read on this Sunday for, well, since 1964, when this new lectionary was adopted, 1963, so it's been there every, every three years, same readings on this day. And it just happens to be what we hear today. And what an encouragement to us, I think. And that, that's the point. The point would, again, not be to, in any way, let what others do, good or ill, get in the way of our knowledge of who our God is and what he has to say to us. And what he has to say to us is that this life is perishing, but he is not. That this world is fading, but he is not. That our bodies are dying, but now his is not. And now, well, now you're not your only body, but his is yours. All of these texts effectively are getting at that. The psalm, which I won't dally on too much, but it's such a Marvelous little thing. I don't know if you've ever tried to learn the prayers that are in our small catechism. Most Missouri Synod congregants grow up saying, Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these or thy, depending on where you are, gifts to us be blessed. Amen. And there's actually two other verses that exist in other places in the LCMS. And if you only say the first and stop when they keep going, you feel really awkward. And then if you try saying the later ones and everyone else stops, that feels awkward too. But... That is probably what you have grown up saying is your table prayer. But that is ah, it's, it's new in the sense that it's only about 100, 200 years old. And before that, there were other table prayers which Dr. Luther had put into the small catechism, which more or less were used by everybody who was a Lutheran up to that point. And they're still there in the small catechism. You'll hear me say a variation of one of these if I ever lead a table prayer for us. The eyes of all look to you, O Lord, and you give them their meat in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Bless us, O Lord our God, and these thy gifts, which we receive from thy bountiful goodness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Luther, in that prayer, has another prayer, or with that prayer, another prayer that is to be said after dinner. Go figure, right? Give thanks before you eat. Give thanks after you eat. Now, you can ask my children, and they will testify to you the three to seven times I've attempted to institute this in our family in the last decade, right? Yeah. Success? No. <laughs> Haven't gotten there. Yeah? But we've tried. Well, th this psalm is where some of the text comes from, and actually, I, I, I love it. Yeah? The young ravens, which cry, is the old translation of it. Uh, it it's about receiving from God our daily bread. That God covers the heavens with clouds, prepares the rain for earth, makes the grass grow. Everything's in his control. And he gives the animals their food and the birds, the ravens, as they cry for food. And of course, why is this here today? Because Jesus is going to talk about the ravens of the field who get their food from God. Yeah? And so Jesus is just teaching what the Old Testament has always said. But it's this next line that is also in the table prayer that perhaps is really worth pondering for us today and connects a little more with our moment in time. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man. Well, you could take that wrong. I mean, he rejoiced to make the creation. He likes the creation. He wanted it. 
right? So to some extent, he clearly delighted in the legs of a man and the strength of the horse. He made them. He designed them. Science to this day continues to be astounded by the depth of information that is contained in DNA and the bodies of everything that there is. Another one of the many random podcasts I listened to recently was talking about plants and how they think. Huh? That if a certain type of insect begins eating on the side of a certain type of tree, the other side of that tree will begin producing more counteractive mycotoxins. On the other side, not where the insects are. Those leaves are gone already. But the tree will react and protect itself from the coming swarm. That's nuts. How did the tree figure that out, right? Oh, well, it evolved over billions of years. It's a miracle. Yeah, you're right. It is a miracle. Huh? The point here is God designed these things because he enjoys being the designer. He likes to give good things. Huh? But so then what does it mean that his delight is not in us? Well, there's a difference between him wanting to make and give and him needing what he has given. Right? Him needing what he has given. Does he need us to do something for him? Or to put it a different way, when God wakes up on Monday morning, how's he feeling? Kind of like you do perhaps? And, and then does he need you to make him feel better? Huh? To perk him up a little bit? Does he need someone to bring him delight? And you might think that's a bit of a crazy thing to say, but I don't preach against this book very often because it doesn't get used as much by name, but it is probably the most influential evangelical book in the U.S. in the last 30 or 40 years, and I guarantee you every single church in Rockford knows about it, the pastors know about it, and most of them are using its philosophy even if they don't know or intentionally aren't doing it. It's just it's dominated the way everyone thinks about what church is and how it should be done. It's called The Purpose Driven Church, and it was followed very quickly by The Purpose Driven Life. I bring it up because in that book, he's very clear about the purpose of worship. He teaches that the purpose of coming to church on Sunday morning is to put a smile on God's face. That God, in fact wants to smile and can't until we come and sing to him. Now, it's kind of a stunning thing, right? But it's right there with footnotes that have Bible verses attached to them that you can go look at the manifold number of translations he pigeonholed stuff from to try to make his argument work. My point in bringing it up now is to demonstrate that this is saying the very opposite of that so that we would not believe such a tomfoolish thing. God does not need us at all. Ever. The cattle on a thousand hills are his. You think you go in your, own your bank account? You think that's yours? That's his. Yeah, he gave it to you to steward, but he, he owns it all. He can take it away when he wants to. Huh? What, is, what does David say when his firstborn son dies, the one that he had with Bathsheba? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. This is not to say that God despises us, but it is to say that should we put our hope and trust and certainty in things that are represented by the works of man, the power of man, the ability of man, or the works of nature, symbolized here by the legs of man and the strength of the horse? Should we put our trust in such things that we are, by definition, not putting our trust in God himself? We, we must not be doing so. You can't do both. That is not who he is. Instead, who he is is the one who, now the English says, takes pleasure in. We'll talk about that. But the, the one who looks upon those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. I believe I've talked about steadfast love to you in the past. If you haven't, make a note of it now. It will come up again in the ESV. Wherever you see those two words, steadfast love, it is one very, very particular Hebrew word. Keseth, K-S-T-H in sounds, Keseth. And it is a word for love, but a word that has no equivalent in English whatsoever. And all our versions of the word love fall way short of trying to capture it. It is a unyielding, undying, total commitment love. 
the kind of love that in theory you vow at your wedding, although American marriage certainly does not have this as part of its real vows and intentions these days. It's the kind of love that would rather die than let you be harmed. The kind of love a parent might have for a child who is in danger in a moment, that, that extreme zeal to be for somebody. Yeah, that's Keswick. And what God wants for us is that we would hope in his, Kesson, in his zeal to save us, to love us, to give to us, to be for us and not against us. That is what he wants for you. Yeah? And this taking pleasure part, again, back in our conversation about does God need a chipper perk up? He's lacking some coffee. We better make him have some pleasure. That would be to fully read our sinful condition into his identity. So it does not mean he needs pleasure he doesn't yet have, but that the eternal reality of his pleasingness, which he wants to give entirely to all, is what follows. His pleasure is for you to fear him. Now, let's pause on the word fear, set it to the side for just a moment. I'm going to come back to that one. Let's run it through Keseth first. God's ultimate desire is for you to know that he is for you and not against you. That's who he is. That's what he wants. That's all he is concerned with. And the rest of it, literally, be damned. Like, like literally, I'm not cursing. That's the word. The rest of it, be damned. Huh? Whatever it might be. This is not to say that, to quote Nacho Libre on behalf of Mike Woolery, he hates all the orphans in the whole wide world. Um, it is to say... That his concern for things like stopping poverty, putting an end to warfare, making sure the governments don't abuse their authority, his concern for that is significantly less than his concern for every single individual human to be brought into communion fellowship with the body of his son, Jesus Christ. And he's going to let all the rest of it collapse if that's what it takes in order to get you there. And by you, he means plural, and the rest too. Huh? With that reality, that certainty of the fullness of all things, the sufficiency of all things in Christ, we then are free to look upon what's going on and answer the question, why is it all look so bad, without necessarily letting the answer destroy our hope. Huh? That we can mourn and grieve over things that we have labored for, worked on, tried our best to make serve our neighbor, and we find that eventually they don't, and that does hurt, but that hurt is not all that there is. There is the resurrection of the dead in Jesus. I had something else I wanted to say. I lost it. So we will continue with fear. Did you notice how much fear is mentioned in Jesus' words to us from the Gospel of Luke? Do not be anxious about these things. Do not worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, all this. You might have heard it said, you cannot serve both God and mammon, right? God and money. You cannot have two, mans two masters. So the idea of serving is, is one thing. But it is also true when it comes to, to fear. I mean, it's possible that you're afraid of both spiders and mice, right? You could be afraid of both. But if you had a hallway with spiders and a hallway with mice and you had to run from one of them, you'd pick one, wouldn't you? So one fear would dominate. You would, you would fear one thing above them all. And the reality of biblical faith is that it does fear God above all other fears. Which is great strength and power, by the way. This is not a reason to run away from God. This is actually a reason to run to God. Because in your fear of him, you are willing to believe him when he says that his unyielding fidelity and extended steadfast love will not abandon you. It's because you fear him and his ability to do all things and to be absolutely true at all times that you would say, oh, he meant it when he said it. I'll run toward him even though he's capable of casting both body and soul into hell. As he says. Huh? So the fear of the Lord in this way... Solomon tells us, is the beginning of wisdom, the foundation of all knowledge. It is the heart of everything. Which then makes the fear of, say, man, or of this world, well, the enemy of this fear of the Lord. 
And I'm not saying that if someone's running at you with an axe, you shouldn't run away from them. Please do. Uh, We should be very aware of the present age. But the question comes back to who is the ultimate fear that you have? When Peter and the other apostles were beaten for preaching the gospel shortly after Jesus was raised from the dead. And then they were told that they would be fine now if they would just stop talking about Jesus being raised from the dead. They'd be allowed to go home. Everything would be great. They responded, we must obey God rather than men. That is, we fear God more than you. Or St. Paul, right into the Galatians, actually gets into the root of the word fear a little bit more. What am I, he says, one who fears men? That I would let you take away from me this gospel? This is great strength, this fear of the Lord. And I want to drive it home again as the counterpart to the keseth, to the love of the Lord. Luther picks up on this in the small catechism as well, does he not? What is the first commandment? We should fear and love God. This is Luther's explanation. We should fear and love God. We should fear and love God. Right? That's it. Those two pieces, they're, they're part of the same coin. But for us, being sinful as we were, we cannot conceive of a fear that is good. Isn't that interesting? We can't imagine a good fear. We, we want to be so in pleasure all the time that we can't see how the less pleasurable emotions are still good. There's all sorts of good fear. There's good fear when you come up to a busy road and you stop before you walk straight into it without looking. That's good fear. I'm glad I have it. Well, the same is what we should understand then applies to the almighty sovereign God who made the heavens and the earth by the breath of his mouth, including all those design stuff I was talking about earlier with the trees and the horses. We should know that he's just not any old God. This is not Zeus. This is not somebody who looks like us and thinks like us and acts like us, like us only just more superpowered-ish. He is totally alien, totally foreign to us in a good way, in a better way, in a way which is able to design you as you are, and more so, having made yourself into the fallen thing you are, to remove the fallen thing from you, but not remove you. That's how powerful this God is. And that, again, is what he says his desire is to do to you. Jesus, the man, the body, dead and raised, is what he says he has done this to you as and in. Huh? The steadfast love of the Lord that never ceases, the mercy that never comes to an end, is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The fear of the Lord that is the beginning of knowledge, that is the font of all wisdom, is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The author of the Hebrews picks up on what this means. And for our last few moments today, I want to look at the end of that section we heard read. It's the section from chapter 11 on faith. It goes on to talk more about faith and those who believe and how, by means of their faith, they were able to do all manner of things, shut the mouths of lions, conquer kingdoms, all sorts of, well, the stuff we would consider good movies. Yeah? But he stops here in the middle to really emphasize, I think, one of the three major points of the entire book. And I I won't go too far into that here. But I do have to prelude it by saying, what is faith? What is faith? Is faith uh, faith merely the desire to want a good thing to happen and to be certain that what you want to happen will happen? That is what the world uses that word to mean. Whether you are talking about heterodox, that's false teaching Christianity, or whether you are talking about people who have no care for Christianity, when George Michael says, you got to have a faith, the faith, the faith, he means you got to just kind of hope it all works out in the end. Huh? That's not what the author means. It's not what the book means. When the Bible talks about faith, it is not a blanket blind hope but a clear and certain trust founded upon something in the past that cannot be removed. Huh? So you have faith that the sun will rise tomorrow. And it's not because you believe in God. It's because the sun rose the day before, and the day before, and the day before, and the day before. And so it would be literally insane to think otherwise, right? So your faith in tomorrow's day is largely based upon the trust that came from today and yesterday and so forth. 
That's the kind of thing the author of the Hebrews is telling us all the Old Testament saints lived and died in the midst of. Something in the past that they could cling to, and by clinging to that past thing, they faced whatever they had before them. So, for example, the guys who conquered kingdoms often, in fact, had a word from a pillar of fire saying, go conquer that kingdom. Okay? And they went, and it happened. By faith, they trusted the promises of God to actually be true. And this is where the author is driving you. You do not have a promise to conquer a kingdom. You do not have a promise that the mouths of lions will be shopped before you. But you do have the promise that you are washed and sanctified in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ by the waters of your baptism. And you do have the promise that you feast upon his ever-living flesh and blood, both divine and human, which, being within you, cannot possibly not be raised from the dead on the last day. Those two promises that you have now put you in fellowship with these Old Testament saints of old. Now, with that being said, he says, these all, verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised but having seen them and greeted them from afar. So what is the things promised in baptism and the Lord's Supper and holy absolution and every word of gospel that is ever given? What is the things promised? The things promised is the resurrection of the dead for you. The things promised is a life without sin for you. That you'll be cleaned entirely inside out and not even know the thought of bitterness or envy or any such thing. A lack of fear of God. That's the promise. And the fact of the matter is that the vast majority of New Testament Christians throughout history have died in the faith, not having received the thing promised in this world. Now, don't get me wrong. You have it by faith. It's all yours in the body of Jesus. But you don't get to experience it out there. Instead, you see it and greet it from afar, having acknowledged that you are a stranger, an exile on earth, just like the patriarchs of old. That while you are here, you are, what's the phrase? It'll come back in October. You are set apart, holy, different, not like the world. How? You have a promise the world does not believe, and you believe it. And you're willing to root your convictions and your life decisions on it. I had a strange comment this week on YouTube from someone, and I had to really think about it. I've heard in the past people, be, people worried that a pastor's politics would influence his theology. But somebody told me this week, Pastor, I think your theology is influencing your politics. And, and I had to pause for a second and say, but, but why would it not? Shouldn't it? I mean, shouldn't I actually do what I believe to be true? And I don't want to get into that in depth now, but this is kind of it. You don't belong out there in terms of what out there says it's about. You have a different mind now. And that mind knows you're an exile here. It knows the certainty of the promises of a city with foundations, he says. A homeland that can never be shaken. And for that reason, knowing you're marching toward that homeland through the exiled desert, whatever the desert does to you, well, it'll bother you. Well, ultimately, it's something that you can, you can fear the Lord more than it. Yeah? That you can, in the midst of your anxieties, which I'm sure you have, you can know that there is one who is fully aware of all of them, and has a better plan than you could ever make. That you can't turn your hair gray or brown without dye. But you know what I mean. Yeah. And that you can't add an hour to your life apart from God saying, Certainly, I give you this knowledge which would put you a little bit longer with your family. And that all of that's okay. And the death's okay. And the failing's okay. Because the foundation we're walking to, it's worth it. It's so worth it that we don't think about that land from which we have gone out. If we did, we would return. But we desire a better country, a heavenly one. And it's, well, it's because of that that God is not ashamed to be our God. But it's really because he's not ashamed to be our God 
that we believe that at all. In the name of Jesus, amen.